thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm so excited to have this crowd together because um, this is a little bit of a different uh, gathering of membership for Home Care Alliance. And, um, and I know we have great work ahead of us today. Um, so, so again, thank you and thanks for making the trip. Um, I always say I, I try to get to Sturbridge one time per year and uh, this is actually my favorite time to come. And even though the uh, leaves might not still be on the trees and it's a little gray, it's, it's just always so beautiful out here. And I don't think I need to put in a plug, but of course you can leave by way of the bakery, so I always do. Um, so this is a bit of a different Home Care Alliance event today in that uh, we, we would not describe this as a one and done. But instead, I look at this as a kickoff conversation that I hope is ongoing and really extends beyond the um, home care delivery community, but really includes elected officials, policy makers, foundations, and even academia. I also look forward to leaving with uh, some real actionable ideas about how we're going to be able to build up this workforce that will allow us to meet the rising demand of the aging population in our state. So with that, everyone knows that our homemakers and our aides are the paid workforce for all of us that help support our uh, system of our long-term services and support. They deliver valuable support to those in need every day who are elders, but also to those that are suffering with disabilities. And equally important, they really provide respite and strong support to a sector of strained caregivers that are out there. I don't think I need to belabor the point of how long and how often that this workforce has been studied, written about, and some really thoughtful recommendations have been made about the looming shortage. But I would dare say, and I think many of you probably agree with me, the looming shortage is no longer there in the future. It's here now. Here are just a few of the organizations or publications that have written about this issue. Kaiser Health News, Forbes Online, Health Affairs, and one of the many pieces authored is by Robin Stone, who we'll, we, we will hear from later today. And of course, also local to Massachusetts, has been the work by MIT's Paul Osterman, who wrote, Who Will Care For Us? So I hope today we achieve or address three particular issues. The first would be, what are the most promising opportunities to strengthen the home care workforce and maximize the role of the changing long-term services and supports in the state? I expect we'll be introduced to such opportunities today as training, as well as technology approaches, and I look forward to that. I also hope that those of you in the room might be willing to share what's working well for you or maybe some new ideas that you're continuing to pilot or starting to pilot. Area number two that I think will be important for us is what type of public and private partnerships might be needed to close the gap between demand and supply? I'm happy to be introducing in a few moments when she arrives Under Secretary Jennifer James Price who is the Undersecretary for Workforce Development in the state of Massachusetts. And, and as a quick aside, depending upon uh, when the Undersecretary arrives, we'll collapse a, a break we had scheduled anyway, just to make sure we make up any lost time. So I look forward to introducing her. And she will talk a bit about the Baker administration, but most importantly, she'll focus on the healthcare workforce collaborative that the state has undertaken in the past year. And they are looking at these issues. I have the good fortune of working on that committee as well, and I'm so pleased that direct care workers have their attention right now. As I referenced earlier, though, it cannot be a single workforce that's looking at this issue. That's why activity such as this is so important. As the state continues to do their work, the Home Care Alliance of Massachusetts will continue to explore what changes we might be pursuing with and on behalf of our membership. And then finally, area number three that I think will be important to look at 
which may not be on the agenda specifically today, but is an important thing, is how does the work vary between states and what other lessons does Massachusetts have the opportunity to learn? I've actually had an opportunity this morning to meet with several different people whose work crosses into different states. So even right in the room uh, here today, I know we have that opportunity to start that learning and I look forward to that. This work about sharing opportunities between states, we at Home Care Alliance think is important enough and uh, robust enough that we hope to share it in a single uh, standalone forum in the future. Thanks, Jake. So one of our hopes is also to be able to tie the work that we're doing to the work of Age-Friendly Massachusetts, that initiative, as well as to the Governor's Council that addresses aging in Massachusetts. Among their areas of focus are well articulated in this executive order, establishing this work as worthy of recognition. And I quote, direct care workers and family caregivers who may struggle to balance work and caregiving provide essential care for older adults, and the demand for this care is growing. And that support for healthy aging may include support for retaining in the workforce those older adults who wish to continue working. The Paraprofessional Institute has published lots of data on the changing demographics of the workforce that certainly point us to this strategy. These two slides on this one slide come from that work. The first shows how the number of younger workers is shrinking and older workers are growing. In fact, the Paraprofessional Health Institute estimates that between 2012 and 2022, only 227,000 women in the age group of 25 to 54 are projected to enter the direct care workforce a fraction of the 1.3 million new workers needed in that same decade to meet the need of the aging in America. This slide also includes other ideas from PHI for attracting more workers in the older demographic to our industry. We at the Home Care Alliance have begun to see this phenomenon first at hand. Many of you are probably aware we do a star reward every year. And in the past several years, our home health aid of the year have all been women that we'll call of a certain age. And they entered the home care workforce only after being at home taking care of their own loved ones. They saw both a skill set match and perhaps a bit of altruism as is referenced in this packet pamphlet. Imagine if we could move our workforce even from 20% older adults to 35 percent. Of course, this also requires that we turn our attention to what was acknowledged in the Massachusetts State Auditor's Report in what was labeled gray warnings, and I quote, the competitive position of the home health industry in the direct labor market has, has declined. Why? Full employment environment strong job growth in other sectors, and rising entry-level wages in a number of competitive industries, coupled with what the report's <coughs> authors referenced as our wage rigidity, were all constraints cited in our workforce. We must also acknowledge, sadly, according to the same report, that the poverty rate among working home health aides is at 11% compared with the employed persons database of the state, citing it at 5.3% for other workers. For personal care aides, it's more dire, at almost three times as high at 16%. And of course, this situation drives people toward higher use of participation in public assistance. So of course, money and funding must always be part of the discussion. But we will clearly in our discussion see today that there are other influences as well. 
On the topic of funding, I'm happy to report that a supplemental budget that has been passed by both the House and Senate in the state of Massachusetts sits on the governor's desk awaiting signature. And this includes $10 million for public sector home, sorry, big fly, for public sector home health aides and homemakers in Medicare and EOEA. This was the result of great industry advocacy that made that happen. And really, kudos to those of you in that, this room that were a part of that. I thank you. Let me just end by saying, again, I am so happy that we have in the room today not only members of the home care community, but also members of the ASAP community, Office of Elder Affairs, and local mass hires workforce boards. Before you leave, two housekeeping issues. First, we will ask that you complete a next step survey to help keep us moving forward. Second, you'll notice that we are recording this event and I'm asking you at some point to perhaps bravely go up to the camera during a break and speak directly, letting us know what your challenges are so we can be most helpful to you. Again, I thank you all so much for coming and I'm excited. Let's get going.